Come on in, guys. Welcome to Idle Out, where we talk all things Survivor. My name is Luke, and today we're talking about the saltiest blindside reactions in Survivor history. The sad fact of the matter is, most people who play Survivor will lose. And if you're gonna go out, you should go out dignified, with your head held high, congratulatory to those that outplayed you, and grateful for a once-in-a-lifetime experience that only a select few ever even get to try. These are not those exits. Sometimes survivor players get a little angry on their way out the door, and with precious few moments to milk between Jeff turning over that final parchment and your torch getting snuffed, it's genuinely impressive the amount of salt some players can squeeze in to such a small time frame. To their credit, at least they're still grabbing their torch and heading for the door instead of giving a pageant speech. I want to keep the scope narrow here, so this won't include salty exit confessionals when the player facing exit was otherwise somewhat gracious. So for now, no Jeff Kent. Don't worry, we'll talk a lot about him when we talk about five times the prize money was only 600 grand by the time Obama takes it. All that said, let's take a look at the saltiest exits in Survivor history and the high sodium players behind them. At number five is Andrew Savage's bird flipping exit in Survivor Cambodia. Because this theme season is second chance, almost everyone is given a story about fixing the mistakes of their past games. Spencer wants to act more humanely, for example, and treat people like humans, not chess pieces. Varner's disappointed he didn't out more people in his first time around back in season two. And Andrew Savage's entire story in Second Chance is how Survivor Pearl Islands is the only bad thing that ever happened to him. I mean, when you see a guy with teeth this straight and white, you know he lives a charmed life. He's got an amazing career. He makes so much money he doesn't know what to do with it. He's got beautiful, intelligent daughters, and his wife is still so smoking hot, just the thought of her hotness brings him to tears. Everything about Savage's life is incredible, except that time he was cast on the biggest reality show in the world, flown to Panama, and went out mid-game, one round shy of the jury phase. Truly haunting. So on second chance, Savage needed to make the jury phase of the game to get some closure. He started on the Bayon tribe, where he aligned with Jeremy and was quickly in a power position at the top of a dominant tribe. Probably the toughest time in Savage's game is at the pretty unfavorable for him swap, where he's sent to start over on a new tribe, Angkor, with only Tasha from his original tribe, up against four original Takeo. Thanks to Abby's chaotic, vengeance-fueled gameplay, Savage survives two rounds on this tribe where he probably should have gone home. At the merge, Savage reunites with his old alliance, but because of some intra-alliance rivalries, the nine strong majority alliance don't split their votes on Wentworth in episode eight, and she negates all nine votes against, sending Savage home with three measly votes from Kelly, Abby, and Sierra. You know, he seems to be holding things together well enough, but loses it when Abby offers some words of encouragement. You made it to the jury. Oh, right back at you. The hilarious thing is, I think Abby was genuinely trying to be kind here. While Savage might have needed to make the jury stage of the game to get some closure in his life, I didn't even know how much I needed Savage to make the jury stage of the game until I saw his jury bench fashion, which appears to be straight out of a Zoomies in 2008. What's going on here? At number four is Keith in Survivor Edge of Extinction, who bid his tribe the best of luck in performing in challenges without him as he bid them adieu. Keith began on the cursed Manu tribe, and like most of this tribe, was not long for the game. In the early days of Manu, Keith initially bonded with fellow outsiders Reem and Wendy, entertaining Reem's plan to help oust Wentworth first, then relaying all that information to the Majority Alliance in an effort to curry favor. Despite absolutely bombing the second immunity challenge, Keith forms an unlikely alliance with a guy on his tribe, and it seems like his fortunes in this game might turn around. A Wentworth blindside is a big move almost too tempting to resist for Rick and David, but everyone backs out at the last minute because Keith is simply too big a challenge liability to keep around. Although Keith apparently disagrees. Wow, wow, wow. I don't think y'all are still gonna win challenges. <sighs> Yeah, without Keith, they'll definitely fail at the challenges. I think we can all agree the Mount Rushmore of Survivor Challenge Beasts is Terry, Joe, Ozzy, and Keith. Roll the tape.
Honestly, he's still probably a better challenge asset for Manu than Wardog. Ah, oh, f*** it. Roll that tape, too. Now, I don't want to be too hard on Keith. He's a young guy, and he was clearly just flailing around for any sort of comeback following a painful elimination. But like, there have got to be better responses. It's like if Zayn said, good luck with strategy, or if Wendy Jo said, good luck having normal social interactions when they were voted out. It just doesn't ring true. In fact, given Keith's documented lack of challenge ability, this almost could be read as genuine. Like. Good luck in challenges without me. Oh, thanks, man. At number three is Michaela's blindside in Survivor Millennials vs. Gen X, courtesy of Jay. Before this swap, things were going pretty great for Michaela. While not tightly aligned with anybody, she was sort of aligned with everybody, managing to move in between the Triforce Alliance and the larger Nerd Alliance with ease. She was also a strong challenge asset and had a good strategic head on her shoulders. So like avocados and texting the letter U instead of Y-O-U, Michaela was highly favored by her fellow millennials. Michaela also gets a pretty sweet deal at the swap. Sent to Ikabula with Millennials Hannah, Jay, and Will, and Gen Xers Brett and Sunday. Ikabula remains intact until the last round of the swap, when they lose the immunity challenge and must vote someone out. It seems pretty clear to the four Millennials that Brett has to go. He's on the outs numerically and a pivotal member in the main Gen X alliance. On top of that, this group of four Millennials is a group Michaela sees going the stretch. She's putting complete trust in them and genuinely talking Final Four with these guys. She's so into that idea that she starts using rocks and shells to explain how the four of them can play the upcoming merge and kind of snake down the middle of all the alliances. Michaela putting her full and complete trust in him and showing him directly how she can get him to the end causes Jay to have an epiphany that Michaela should go home pre-merge. Even though, as he admits to Will later, Michaela hasn't lied and her only alliance is the two of them. I mean, sounds like a pretty good reason to keep someone to me, but uh, what the heck do I know? So Jay and Will team up with Brett and Sunday to blindside Michaela right out of the game. And at Tribal, Michaela's salt levels justifiably go through the roof when she sees the telltale third vote for her. Michaela. That's three votes, Michaela. Two votes, Brett. One vote left. Did you do that? Yeah. I did it. As great as Michaela's salty reaction is, it's Jay's ice cold answer to her that he did it that does it for me. If only he'd voted correctly, like, ever again, we could have gotten more of that. At number two is Natalia's exit in Survivor David vs. Goliath. Natalia may be the most paranoid Survivor player since Jamie Newton, and much like Jamie, her paranoia and constant need to be affirmed was her downfall. Unlike Jamie, she wasn't so stoked about her blindside. Blindsided, nice! Now that's how you vote somebody out! Natalia, I think, was playing a fine game before Alec decided to say F it and completely bamboozle her at the swap. On Goliath Beach, she was in what seemed to be a decently solid majority of six, with a ride or die in Kara. Natalia swapped into a pretty good position, sent to Vuku with allies Kara and Alec from the Goliath tribe, with Davy and Elizabeth from the David tribe as easy eliminations. But things soon turned sour for Natalia, as her survivor BFF Kara bonds with Elizabeth over horses, leaving Natalia in the awkward position where two people are having a conversation that you can contribute nothing to, but you've been standing around for too long that it would be awkward to walk away, so you just contribute what little you can to the topic at hand. I wish I had a horse. Yeah. After Vuku loses the next immunity challenge, it should be an easy vote for Davy or Elizabeth, especially considering Carl, who's on Exile Island, will be joining the tribe after this vote. 
Natalia wants Elizabeth gone because of the horse girl bond thing that's going on with her and Kara, but her constantly talking over Alec and constant need to be reaffirmed that the three of them are sticking together irritates Alec so much that he just joins up with Davy and Elizabeth instead to vote her out. I knew it. I knew I couldn't trust you. Be sorry, shut up. This elimination's so good, I can even forgive the obnoxious, unsubtitled Tribal Council whispering moments before. Why are you smiling? Oh my god, I can't handle you right now. The saltiest exit in Survivor history is who else? Judd in Survivor Guatemala. Here are a few fast facts about Judd. He's the first player to receive an idol clue, he's not a bad sportsmanship, and he does not have ADD. Judd started on the Nakum tribe, quickly earning his keep as a needed physical competitor in challenges, able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe in the very tough Guatemala challenges against powerhouse Gary Hawkins, a humble landscaper who definitely was not ever in the NFL. At a 4-4 swap, Judd is swayed to join the old Yasha members by Stephanie and Jamie into voting out Brooke, kickstarting a feud with his old tribe mate Margaret, who's mad that Judd jumped ship. That boils over in a legendary tribal council rant from Judd in episode 6, where he accuses Margaret of calling him a bad sport, he is, asks his tribe if he listens to them then steamrolls over all their answers, and then accuses Margaret of saying he has ADD. She did not. Well, who needs Margaret anyway? Flipping was a pretty good move for Judd as it ingratiated him with Steph, Rafe, and Jamie, and they enter the merge with a majority and begin picking off the other tribe one by one. When the last member of the opposing alliance, Danny, wins immunity at final six, she orchestrates an underratedly good vote to get rid of Judd, convincing Stephanie that Judd's still upset about them blindsiding Jamie, and she even gets the Juddisms right. I mean, she's short about a half dozen mans, but still. With Steph, Rafe, and Lydia locked in, the episode culminates in a Judd blindside. As he's taken out by the very members of the Alliance, he initially flopped to. Judd. Thanks, guys. Hope you guys all get bit by a freaking crocodile. Scumbags. Judd's party words are the perfect encapsulation of him as a Survivor character. Vindictive, accidentally hilarious, and very, very salty. You know, you got to admire a man who wishes death upon the rest of his tribe on his way out the door. Got nothing else for you. Don't be a scumbag, like and subscribe, and I'll get you more Survivor content just like this. Until next time, don't get idled out.